Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to get started now. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Katherine Tice, and I am a postdoctoral postdoctoral fellow at the Wolf Humanities Center here at UPenn, and I have the privilege of introducing our final session today, um, the topic of which is case studies between exceptional and the representative. Um, our second speaker today is Roger Wick from the Morgan Library and Museum, where he is the Mel Melvin at R. Sidon Curator and Departmental Head of Medieval and Re Renaissance Manuscripts. Um, where he's been since 1989. He previously held curatorial positions at the Walters Art Museum and at Harvard University. He has curated a number of exhibitions at the Morgan and written exhibition catalogs and books. Um, I'll note some of, some of the more famous because there are many, um, including Printed Prayers, The Book of Hours in Medieval and Renaissance Art um, from 1997, which my students will be reading next term. Um, and uh, that was part of an exhibition on the medieval bestseller. He recently organized a number of exhibitions, including Illuminating Faith, the Eucharist and Medieval Life and Art, um, 2014's Miracles in Miniature, the Art of the Master of, the Cla of Claude of France. Um, his most recent publication, out in 2017, focused on the medieval calendar, um, Locating Time in the Middle Ages, which was published in conjunction with the exhibition, Now and Forever, the Art of Medieval Time, which closed this past April. Um, he also teaches courses on illuminated manuscripts and the Book of Hours for the Rare Book School, um, two courses which are on my list of things to take there. In his own time, and for two generations after his death, the artist Jean Poyer enjoyed great fame. Documented from 1465 to 1498, and then dead by 1504, he worked for the royal court of Queen Charlotte of Savoy, the wife of Louis XI, and later for Queen Anne de Bretagne and for Charles the and for both of her husbands, Charles VIII and Louis XII, and for courtiers within their circle. He painted panels, illuminated manuscripts, drew, designed stained glass, and managed stage sets for royal entries, some of those tableau vivants that were touched on this morning. Contemporary authors compared his talents with those of Jean Fouquet of France, Jan van Eyck and Hugo van der Goes of the Netherlands, Albrecht Dürer in Germany, and even Raphael and Michelangelo. Heady company, indeed. But Poyer's fame was short-lived. At the end of the 16th century, like all medieval artists who were primarily illuminators and who did not sign their works, he was forgotten, and he remained forgotten for 300 years. Today, I'm going to talk about the artist Jean Poyer in three sections. First, I will narrate his unsteady but ultimately triumphant rise from obscurity to rediscovery. Second, I will offer my opinion of what makes him such a great artist. And third, I will su suggest some areas of research that I believe are promising avenues pointing to new insights within his work. In the 19th century, a payment document to a certain Jean Poyer dated 29 August 1497 for a petit sir, a small book of hours, commissioned by Queen Anne de Bretagne was linked to that period's most favorite illuminated manuscript, the Grand Zur of Anne de Bretagne, an opening of which you see on the screen. No matter that the document's tally of miniatures, borders, and line endings did not match those found in the Grand Zur, Authors insisted that the 1497 payment, payment document was indeed for Anne's great book of hours and that therefore the artist named in that account, Jean Poyer, was the creator of this fabulous manuscript. Poyer's reputation was so well regarded that even after the payment document linking Jean Bordichon to Anne's Grand Zur was discovered and published in 1880, some writers still insisted on Poyer's participation, assigning to him the book's famous flowers. 
this forced notion did not last very long. When Bordichon was accepted as the illuminator of the Grand Zur, Poyer's name was discarded. When the Petit Zur of the 1497 document could not be located, his career took a nosedive. <laughs> any illumination of any quality, and much that was not, was now happily attributed to Jean Bourdichon. <laughs> Poyer was forgotten again. But today, in 2018, Poyer is very much remembered, his reputation restored. How did we get from zero to 60? Poyer's comeback began in the 1980s and 1990s. A body of work emerged roughly contemporaneous with that of Jean Bourdichon, but seen as stylistically different. Janet Backhouse attributed this emerging oeuvre to an artist she called the master of the Tilio Hours, after that eponymous manuscript in the British Library that she deemed most characterized the artist's work. An artist who could, or could not, she said, be Jean Poyer. Two major exhibitions presented the argument that this major artist indeed was most likely Poyer. John Plummer's Morgan Library exhibition, The Last Flowering, presented in New York in 1982, and the exhibition that Nick referred to this morning that he did not get to see, but I did. <laughs> Age has its privileges. <laughs> Francois Avril and Nico Renaud's exhibition at the Bibliothèque Nationale, Quand la peinture était dans le livre in 1993, with its accompanying publication, Le Manuscrit à Peinture en France. The catalogues for these two shows established a large oeuvre and attached Poyer's name to it. Awed by the quality of the work attributed to Poyer, convinced of the connection of his name to that oeuvre, and backed by a collection rich in his, in his works at the Morgan Library, I curated, as Nick mentioned this morning, a one-man exhibition to the artist in 2001, the first ever, if one dis puts aside the Spanish forger briefly, <laughs> the first ever held at the Morgan Library uh, for an illuminator. <laughs> Jean Poyer, artist to the court of Renaissance France. With contributions by Morgan colleagues Michelle Hearn and William Vokley, I wrote two books for this occasion a double act of chutzpah I do not recommend. <laughs> the first publication was a deluxe facsimile of Poyer's charming Prayer Book of Anne de Bretagne, a book I now prefer to call the primer of Charles Orlan, which belongs to the Morgan Library. The second book was a George Braziller facsimile of Poyer's Hours of Henry VIII, easily pace to Janet Backhouse and her Tilio Hours, the artist's masterpiece. In essays I wrote for these publications, I unveiled two discoveries. First, I suggested that a single leaf with a miniature of the Lamentation in the Philadelphia Free Library is the sole surviving folio from that famously documented but otherwise lost and elusive 1497 Petit Sir of Anne de Bretagne. This is a crucial piece of material culture. The Free Library's Leaf is the only work of art that can be linked to a payment document that has the name of Jean Poyer on it. The sadly abraded lamentation on the screen is the smoking gun for the artist's entire oeuvre. Second, I pointed out a small but overlooked coat of arms in a book of ours in the Taylor's Museum in the Dutch city of Harlem, identifying the arms as those of the famous Brissonnet family of Tours. I suggested that the Harlem Codex had been commissioned by Guillaume Brissonnet around 1485 as a gift to his wife when, she, when he had been appointed France's Secretary of the Treasury and the first chair of the Council of State by Charles VIII. Um, on the screen, obviously, is not the coat of arms. I mean, it's the Brissonnet coat of arms, but I don't have a slide of the actual folio that has the arms. But it was tucked into a tiny initial. How does this red light? Of about that size on a text page 
So it had been sort of always ignored and overlooked. I have to say that in the following years, both of my suggestions were accepted by scholars. In 2004, just three short years following my monographic Morgan exhibition and its accompanying publications, Poyer's position within the history of French art was totally reclaimed. In that year, Mara Hoffman's exemplary monograph on the artist was published, Jean Poyer, Das Gesamtwerk. The Musée de Louvre included Poyer in it, its exhibition, Primitive Francais, Découverte et Redécouverte, which featured a large group of 15th century French artists whose careers and oeuvres had been rediscovered and reconstituted. In this installation shot, you can see on the left a single leaf and two codices in that case of, of two codices by Poyer, and on the right, a little bit of his Magdalene triptych, which actually, uh, the wings of which you can see better in this installation shot. I wish to thank uh, my colleague and our speaker this morning, Frederick Elsig, who it was over 20 years ago, in the late 90s, he very kindly drove me to the small parish church in the Juras in Sanso to see these panels. So um, thank you again, Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> Poyer's reputation and his name, now solidly reestablished and given an imprimatur by no less an institution than the Louvre, he was featured alongside other long-established artists in a dazzling series of three exhibitions celebrating French art in the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. In 2010, the Grand Palais in Paris presented France, Mille Sans Saint, Entre Moyen-Âge et Renaissance. Poyer was represented by a drawing four codices, including the Brissonnet Hours and the Morgan's Hours of Henry VIII, and the complete Madeleine Triptych, which if you squint, you can kind of see at the far left in that installation shot from the Grand Palais. In 2011, Chicago's Art Institute was the second venue for the exhibition, retitled for the American audience, Kings, Queens, and Courtiers, Art in Rena Early Renaissance France. Shown from Poyer's oeuvre were two drawings, four manuscripts, including the Brissonnet Hours, and from the Morgan, both the primer of Charles Orlan and the Hours of Henry VIII, and in Chicago, the wings from the Madeleine Triptych for which a microclimate case was designed. Finally, in 2012, the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Tours presented Tours, Mille Sans Cinq Cents, <laughs> Capital des Arts. That show included the monumental Liget altarpiece, which I'll get to shortly, one of the wings of the Madeleine Triptych, a stained glass fragment attributed to Poyer, two drawings, two leaves, and five codices, including, again, the Morgan's Hours of Henry VIII. Finally, in 2015, a deluxe color facsimile was published of the Morgan's Hours of Henry VIII with a commentary volume that I wrote appearing the following year in 2016. And just last year, in 2017, Samuel Gras published this exciting discovery of a previously unknown missile that Poyer illuminated for Charles VIII between 1482 and 1491, when the king, a period during which the king was betrothed to Margaret of Austria. It's been a bit of a whirlwind, but I have been gratified to think that I played at least a minor role in the recovery of a great artist his of and his reputation. So now, in the second part of my talk, what makes, <laughs> what makes him such a big shock to me? Let's start with the Brissonnet hours that I showed earlier, the earliest codex that can be given to Poyer, the earliest but already a magnificent creation. In 1483, as I mentioned earlier, Guillaume Brissonnet was appointed to France's Secretary of the Treasury and raised to the first place of the Council of State. 
The Brissini hours on the screen is just the sort of showy gift a man whose stock had meteorically risen might confer on his productive wife, Raoulette, who had given her husband five children. Although part of Poyer's quote-unquote early work in both style and iconography, the Brissonet Hours is clearly the creation of an established master. The manuscript already exhibits Poyer's main stylistic characteristics, a masterful command of clearly articulated space, both interiors and landscapes, a frequent use of chiaroscuro, figures that are solid and articulated, and often shown in quattroposto, daring color juxtapositions, and a fondness for Italian Renaissance architectural detail. In the Annunciation on the screen, many of, those, many of these features are in evidence. The draperies of both the Virgin and Gabriel suggest the weight and postures of these two figures. Mary's prie-dieu is not parallel to the picture plane, but at a slight askewed angle which helps us to read the positions of the two figures of Mary and Gabriel in relationship to each other. The vanishing point is at the far right of the picture, a position that allows Poirier to delineate the Renaissance cloister, its columns, and its interior fountain. A streaming crowd of angels walking through the cloister further helps us in our understanding of its architectural layout. Color in the miniature might seem traditional for late 15th century France until one notices the alternating pink and blue columns, the use of red in the shadows of the cloth of gold covering the prie-dieu, the lilac shading Gabriel's pink albe, and the startling juxtaposition at the very center of the miniature of the cherry red of the chemise of the Virgin's Book of Hours with the hunter green of the pillow on which the book rests. In this miniature of Joab stabbing Abner in the back, Poirier creates a kaleidoscope of cherry red, royal blue, hunter green, gold, and yellow the jarring juxtapositions of which reflect the violence of the theme. But note the subtle mix of red and blue in Abner's headgear, that's the guy getting stabbed, and the careful shading of green velvet in the sleeve of Joab. The heft of these two combating figures is easily indicated by differing positions of their legs, Joab's shoulder, and Abner's twisting, tormented torso. In the miniature of Mark, Poirier reveals the source for much of his style, Italy. While the evangelist, accompanied by a husky lion, examines the tip of his quill, behind him, through the classical arches of the Renaissance portico, lie the canals of Venice. We see two bridges and a gondolier plying the waves. Poirier is letting us know that he has seen the fabled city whose streets are filled with water, the city of which Mark is the patron and his lion the symbol. A first-hand knowledge of North Italian art at an early stage in Poirier's artistic de development left an indelible impression on the painter and was a continual influence on his work. From his Italian experience, which must have included works by Andrea Mantegna and Giovanni Bellini, Poirier borrowed the quiet and pensive dignity of his figures and the stillness and depth of his landscapes. Direct contact with the real thing in situ gave Poirier the ability to represent believable Italian spaces. I will return to the theme of Poirier and Italy in the third part of my talk. The second early work, again, early in quotes, only because we have nothing prior, is the large Liget altarpiece presently housed in the Chateau of Loche near Tours. The large panel contains Christ carrying the cross, the crucifixion, and the entombment. It is conveniently dated 1485 in the left scene, though the lack of clarity in my slide doesn't allow you to read that. And in the right, it is inscribed F-I-B near the head of a kneeling monk. Wearing the white robes of a Carthusian, this donor figure has been identified as Frater Ioannis Beraudi, prior 
of the Charter House of Liger between 1483 and 1490, which is located in the forests of Loche, the Charter House being the original home of the altarpiece. Like Guillaume Brissonnet, Jean Béraud also apparently celebrating a promotion uh, with a commission from the leading artist in Tours. Attributed for over a hundred years to the quote-unquote school of Fouquet, the work has been regarded as a secure work by Poyer, following observed analogies between it and works attributed to Poyer, especially the Brissonnet hours that we just saw. Such figures as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea at the far right are similar in their articulation and heft to men in the Brissonnet hours. A commission from the Charter House of Liget for a large altarpiece from a major artist like Poyer should not surprise us. Although a small town, Loche was not only a small distance from Tours, but it was also, it contained a royal chateau, one of the many castles owned and visited by Charles VIII and Anne de Bretagne. And it's there, as I mentioned earlier, where the altarpiece is kept today. In 1490 begins the decade to which most of Poyer's work is to be dated. Within this decade, the Primer of Charles Orlan can be securely dated between 10 October 1492 and 6 December 1495, the birth and death dates of the child whom you see on the screen for whom the manuscript was made, the Dauphin Charles Orlan. The manuscript was probably created around 1495 when the child was about three years old, as you can see, right around the time when he was praying his rosary and learning how to pray. The primer was commissioned by his mother, Anne de Bretagne, so she could teach the child his catechism. Each of the manuscript's borders contains the ropes of her cordelier and the letters that spell her name, the A's, N's, and E's. The book opens with the basic prayers that all Christian children were taught to memorize, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Apostles' Creed, graces for meals, and the act of confession, which you see on the screen. In the miniature, Anne dutifully confesses her sins. She is a model penitent to her young son. The remaining devotions include a dozen suffrages, such as this one for St. Helena, in addition to the portrait of the queen, the book includes on its last leaf this portrait of Charles Orlan, praying for the wisdom with which to occupy the future throne of France. It is shown, however, not as a three-year-old child, but in a projected portrait as a 12-year-old 12 12-year-old 12 youth. And as we know, sadly, he never got past the age of slightly three years. The style of Poyer's the style of the primer is different from the Brissonnet hours and the Liget altarpiece. Forms and surfaces that had been fixed and hard in those early works are now treated more impressionistically. The careful and concealed brushworks of the earlier works is replaced here with small, quick, visible applications of paint. Another significant difference between the early works and the prayer book is the palette. In general, in the 1490s, Poyer's palette is lighter, more pastel-y. Daring color, color juxtapositions which characterize Poyer's early creation are taken in a new direction in the 90s. They are now much more subtle. Take, for example, these angels holding a monstrance in what I believe is the most striking miniature from this small manuscript. The robes of the two angels in front are pale lilac while their wings are a light blue. The other two angels are dressed in pistachio green with light purple wings. This new lightness of tone is paralleled to in the way figures are depicted. They now seem easier on their feet and move with a bit less weight and a bit more grace. Proportionately too, they're a bit taller and their heads are a bit smaller. Poyer returns to his grand manner in the hours of Henry VIII from around 1500, but in the process he updates this manner and refashions it. We don't know for whom the manuscript was made, but it was certainly not made for Henry VIII. A romantic 17th century legend attaches it to him. It is truly a grand manuscript, larger at 25.6 and 18 centimeters, larger than any of the books that I've discussed so far, 
and with 55 miniatures, it is the richest. Here is the opening to April and May with the calendar, within the calendar. Its labors of the months are nearly half size, half page in size. They reveal Poyer's skill at handling landscapes. The feast days are framed with varying monochrome borders in which the red letter feasts are illustrated. The compositions, especially those that are full page, are truly monumental, an effect achieved by increasing the size of the figures relative to, to their surroundings. The perspective in many of the miniatures, too, helps reveal the justification behind Poyer's fame in that realm. I'll touch on that later. The elegance of the spatial clarity of this enunciation, for example, is a tour de force where space flows seamlessly from a clearly defined interior onto a portico and then into a nearly neatly laid out garden and then to a distant cityscape and finally to the horizon filled with faraway hills. Rich landscape and perspective perspectively rendered sheds are combined to masterful effect in this, in this annunciation to the shepherds. Note the audacity with which the artist depicts the back of the main shepherd at the lower left and doesn't even show his face. In this, one of my favorite images from the book, John the Evangelist is depicted descending into his own grave. In the background, figures move about in a penumbral chiaroscuro, confused as to what exactly John is getting, not up to, but down to. <laughs> the foreground is brightly lit with royal blue and brilliant white juxtaposed. The white-blue juxtaposition is reprised by the text area and its border. Now in this, my third and concluding part of my talk, I would like to suggest three areas of research that I believe could open up and elabor elaborate upon aspect of Poyer's art that has till now either been ignored or little explored. The first one I wish to touch on is Poyer's command of perspective. The French Renaissance author, Jean Pellerin, known as Vietor, cites Poyer in his De Artificiale Perspectiva the first printed book on perspective with illustrations. Along with Alberti's and Durer's, it is one of the outstanding Renaissance treatises on the subject of perspective. The poem of praise that actually appears on the title page of the second edition of 1509 and the third of 1521 actually cites Poyer in the fifth line following the fifth line from the top, and he's listed just after Fouquet. All right, see that? Okay. <laughs> Over a half century after he died, Poyer's skills in perspective and painting were rated above those of Fouquet and his two sons by Jean Breche of Tours in his De Verborum Significatione, printed in 1556. How does Poyer, for instance, stack up against Piera della Francesca? On the screen is Piero's Brera altarpiece of the early 1470s with its perfectly positioned vanishing point upon which the orthogonals of his single point perspective converge to a pinpoint on the head of the Virgin. Piero was, of course, famous for his knowledge and use of perspective. He wrote his De Perspectiva Pigendi, the earliest and only pre-1500 Renaissance treatise devoted to the subject of perspective, authored just around the time he was painting this altarpiece. I traced the floor tiles and the edges of the furniture and architecture in one of the calendar miniatures from the hours of Henry VIII. I think Poyer does pretty well. <laughs> I did the same for this monumental annunciation. And again, I was impressed. I didn't know what I was going to find when I took out my big pen and started scratching on photocopies. Um, I'm convinced that Poyer um, somehow studied and mastered perspective, and he wasn't just winging it uh, when he was painting these kinds, of, these kinds of miniatures. The second area of research that warrants Digger D deeper digging is Poyer's 
Drawings and underdrawings. Five drawings by Poyer are a rare survival in 15th century France. They are elaborately conceived with deep landscapes and foreground and middle ground scenes that unfold narratives. Here, walking up the hill, Abraham looks back upon his son Isaac, who, unbeknownst to himself, carries the wood for the fire that was intended to burn his sacrificed body. Two men in the foreground attend to the donkey they rode, one watching the father and son climb the path, and the other, tired or bored, rests on the back of the beasts. Poyer excels in depicting figures in contrapposto and in moving through space. Abel's successful sacrifice and Cain's failure, as seen in the middle ground, leads to the foreground scene of Cain killing his brother. Authors have discussed how these Old Testament scenes could have been sketches for panels or for a series of tapestries, but not discussed, at least what I can find, is uh, their style, which strike me as much more Italianate than Northern. What is strongly sensed in the drawings is the body beneath the clothing. Note in particular Cain's left shoulder and arm. From drawings to underdrawings, using a spectrocam shortwave infrared camera, Xiaoping Kai and Abigail Merritt, conservation fellows at the Morgan's Thaw Conservation Center, obtained elaborate underdrawings of two miniatures from the Morgan's missile of Guillaume Lallemand, illuminated by Poirier around 1500. These infrared reflect Reflectance images unveiled Poyer's working method of sometimes drawing the nude figure before painting the enveloping drapery. And I refer to, of course, this blue drapery here. But notice we've got a thigh, a section of a, a calf, another thigh, and another calf, and a shin and knee, all drawn, which is being completely obliterated by the drapery that he painted on top of the figure. This recent work at the Morgan confirms an examination of the Lalamont missile that was done by Robert, Dr. Robert Fuchs and Doris Oltraga in 1997 when they achieved similar results. Finally, and we achieved a similar result from the examination of this Pentecost figure with, again, He's drawing like an Italian. <laughs> Finally, I and others have touched on the influence of Italian art on Poyer, but that's just it. Most of us have just touched on it. Of the three areas of suggested research, this is the one that I think would bear the sweetest fruit. We know of certain Italian works of art that were brought up from the South by Charles VIII and Louis XII from inventories or from their later provenances under the, uh, under the ownership of Francois, Francois Premier. A painting by Perugino on the screen of Jerome in the Wilderness, now in the Musée de Beaux-Arts at Caen, is thought to have entered the royal collections during the reign of Louis XII. Peter Borusowski, curator of drawings at the National Museum in Warsaw, is soon to publish his belief, to, uh, to which I concur, that Perugino's panel directly influenced Poyer on the miniature of the same subject that he painted in the hours of Henry VIII. Another Perugino panel, this one of Saint Sebastian, is known to have entered the royal collections, also probably under Louis XII, but it is presently lost. I show you another one of Perugino's Sebastians that is in the Louvre that is thought to be very similar to the lost panel. Perugino's lost panel is thought to have influenced Jean Bordichon in the Sebastian he painted for the Grand Zur of Andre Britannia, as most recently discussed and 
and illustrated in his exhibition by Tom Crenn in the Renaissance Nude, currently up at the Getty. Likewise, Perugino's panel could have influenced Poyer in the Sebastian he painted in the hours of Henry VIII. But Poyer could have also seen Antonella de Messina's Sebastian from around 1478 on the left, or Giovanni Bellini's composition from circa 1465 in the middle, both of which he could have seen in Venice or its environs. On a recent trip to Venice, I was struck by the triptych of the Virgin and Child with Saints by Giovanni Bellini in the Basilica of Santa Maria dei Frari. Dating to 1488, it could have been seen by Poyer and influenced his composition of the Virgin and Child from the hours of Henry VIII. This miniature from the manuscript was earlier sliced out and is now owned by the Louvre. In both the altarpiece and miniature, a powerful, three-dimensionally realized figure of the Virgin sits within a rounded niche surrounded, surmounted by a dome. Both compositions are framed by elaborate Renaissance architecture. But Poyer's Madonna could easily be, be a composition based on the recollection or sketches that Poyer might have made from other monumental Madonnas, such as Bellini's San Giobbe altarpiece from the 1480s, or from Pierre della Francesca's Brera altarpiece that we saw earlier from the 1470s, or from Andrea Mantegna's Sanzino altarpiece from the 1450s. He could have seen them all. Did Poya get as far south as Florence? The spatial delineations by Polito or Pietro Donzello this Annunciation installed in France in Florence's Capella Frescobaldi in the Church of Santo Spirito reminded me of Poyer's Annunciation from the Hours of Henry VIII. Note in both the use of floor tiles, a Renaissance arcade, a portico, a garden with fencing, a distant landscape. I'll not claim that Poyer saw this painting, but I'm convinced he saw something like it. The comparisons I've offered you today are only those that I've stumbled upon. I've done no serious looking. And that's my point. I'm convinced, and I hope you are too, that serious combing through Italian art that Poyer could have seen on a trip or trips to Venice and the Veneto, starting with Venice, would, I believe, flesh out and influence the nature of our understanding of the Italian art that it had on the art of Poyer. Thank you.